Okay, well, at least I'm recording on Zoom. So that's going to be a relatively crappy version. Yeah, yeah. Um, where do you want to have the uh, picture taken from? From close up or from far away? It uh, doesn't really matter as long as it's not something on that slide as well. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fair enough. Um, right. Yeah, I'll, I'll check with Chris what that it is before the presentation. Sounds good. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Hello. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Deep Learning One. Welcome to this course in your master's degree. Let's see, this should be all right. Now you don't hear my breathing. All right, so this is the first lecture. We will be trying to record the lectures. It doesn't seem to be recording yet, so for now, I'm recording it here on Zoom as well. Yeah, all right. And uh, yeah, this will be the first lecture. I'll be giving you some organizational guidelines, etc. But first of all, uh, who am I? So my name is Yuki. I am an assistant professor with the uh, video image sense lab here at the University of Amsterdam. I work on self-supervised learning, multimodal learning, privacy and bias in computer vision, and some other research directions. Before that, I did my, v, uh, my PhD in Oxford at the Visual Geometry Group, and uh, I did before that applied mathematics, physics, and economics, so I don't really have the computer science background which should hopefully make this lecture a bit more easier to understand, I'm thinking for you, um, because I didn't have the proper training in a way to do deep learning, but now all I do is, is deep learning indeed. Um, all right, so yeah, about self-supervised learning, actually I just came back from a workshop at a conference, which is called European Conference for Computer Vision. It happened in Tel Aviv. And what we did here is we organized a workshop on this topic of self-supervised learning. And here's a picture that we took. So it was a room full of researchers and we invited some people to give some talks. And uh, some, we had some posters where people uh, talked about their recent works and it was overall a really nice experience. And what just wanted to share this, that these sort of conferences are very typical for, for the computer science and AI community where you basically Go there, present some papers, you publish your papers, which get peer reviewed, and you discuss recent results. You have these workshops, just like we did. And the best part is basically you hang out with some researchers and you talk about the papers, developments, things you don't understand, things you do understand. And we're hoping that in this course, you will have a similar feeling, especially in your tutorials, where you get to hang out with PhDs and master students that are already in the research phase. Um, more specifically, these are the teaching assistants. So we've really handpicked them this, this year. So they're, they're pretty much the best people that could be teaching you. Uh, they, in terms of grades, in terms of their motivation, in terms of being nice and already being in, in the research part of their career, so to say. Um, you will be seeing them both in your sessions, which I'll get to in a bit, as well as online. The prerequisites, um, they have not changed from, from any of the last years. So you should have seen them on the course catalog and so on. So this is machine learning one, which you all did very recently. We'll need some basic calculus and linear algebra. Um, importantly, we'll need some programming. Uh, this is very quick to pick up, but of course, everyone knows who has done a bit of programming. The debugging is the most annoying part and uh, so you need a certain willingness to do it. And that's why we have this time, patience, and drive here as well. Um, but trust me, the, the course, course is really worth it. In the end, you'll, you'll be looking back and saying that, uh, OK, I learned a lot from this course. And you, you get to apply it to many different uh, topics as well. A bit about the philosophy and organization of this course. <laughs> So this course aims to balance both the theoretical part and the practice part. 
And by theory, we don't necessarily mean that you need to prove things, although we'll have some things there, but, uh, but more the, the fundamental things that you need to know. The course itself is organized basically in theory, which is uh, what we'll be doing here in the lectures, even though it's, it's not theoretical at all um, for, mo for the most part. And then the practice, which is, uh, which, for which we have tutorials and uh, laptop colleges. The materials will be on these uh, pages, which I'll link to. We'll also be putting the, the slides on Canvas, so you can actually click on these links and, and uh, go to these pages. We'll have a forum on Piazza, um, which I've already linked to in the first Canvas message. If you're not in the Canvas yet, please let me know uh, after the lecture or in the break. Piazza is a very good forum where you can ask questions, you can answer them yourselves, you can answer questions from other students, our TAs can answer questions, I can answer questions and so on. So this will be our Q&A platform for the most part. The practicals, I'll go to them in a bit, they're individual. So the, in the practicals, these are the assignments basically. So uh, you will have to hand in three assignments, uh, which are graded and in which you do some programming by yourselves. Um, but you will be able to, to ask questions and work on them during the tutorials. The lectures will be recorded. Uh, remind me, starting from next time. Um, this time it is, at least my local version is recording, so that's fine. <clears throat> and yeah, it will be a lot of content for you, but it is, I mean, everyone knows the AI craze it will be worth it. Like you'll be able to make sense of a lot of deep learning developments by just this course. So you don't even, like even before you take deep learning two or some specialized courses, you'll be able to tell, okay, what's behind this technology? Does this make sense? Is this realistic, etc. Another philosophy I want to give you guys is that, uh, give you all, is, this, is that deep learning is an engineering science. So really what this means is, we're not very rigorous yet. So it's a, I mean, deep learning, and we'll go to this in a bit later in the lecture, is a very, very recent area. So we don't have any overarching theories of why something works or um, fundamental principles and axioms. Lots of it is simply still intuition and uh, plenty of hands-on experience will lead you to develop this sort of intuition. So figuring out what works, what doesn't, why it might work, why it might not work, what are interesting research directions, et cetera. You will build this over time. So there's not, there's some, of course, there's some textbooks by now, which will give you the basics, just as this course does. But fundamentally, it's the practicals will be one of the most important part. So I invite you to, to do the practicals and not only do them, but also make plenty of mistakes because that's how you learn, at least we're not that kind of engineering science where like a whole bridge breaks down if we do mistakes. So like enjoy the bugs, enjoy the uh, process of finding these as well. This field moves very quickly. I'll have some examples later on in this lecture. Um, it is really ridiculous how many papers get published every week and every month on a topic that you're working on and you think you're in this very specialized domain that no one else is working on. Well every week new papers will get published and your understanding of the current field just moves very quickly. Um, so reading papers is really essential and I'll be hopefully motivating you to read a couple of these as well during the course. Um, yeah, so here's, because the field is move, moving quickly, there's some bad news in the sense that some of the stuff we teach will be outdated very soon. So. I might be saying this particular function or this particular part of a neural network is very important and it works very well in the current setting. It does. I, I won't be telling any lies, but maybe in two years, no one will be using that anymore. Um, so one key aspect of this course is to develop the skills that you can independently delve into new topics. So if you're working at a company or you're doing research in two years, you know what has been around two years ago because you're taking the, you've taken this course and you will be able to learn by yourself the new topics. And yeah, my own opinion for this course and generally is that it's much more important to develop, it, to develop an intuition than to learn things by heart. 
of course, we will have an exam where you will have to learn things by heart, um, but that doesn't exclude the intuition part. The lectures themselves will be as follows. Uh, this is a general plan. Of course, each lecture has some, some subparts and so on. So we will have a basic introduction. That's today. We'll talk about what deep neural networks are and how to optimize them, how to train them. Optimize and train is a synonym in this case. And then a specific type of neural networks. We'll look into uh, convolutional neural networks and transformers, graph neural networks, and then we'll talk about a different paradigm of generative modeling, deep variational inference, and uh, applications into 3D space, which are very recent. So we'll have a guest lecturer for this, as well as uh, applications into physics, also very recent. Um, we'll have a guest lecturer. And then self-supervised learning, the topic uh, which we just had a workshop on at ECCV, uh, which has two flavors. So in the first lecture, we'll look into mainly images. And in the second lecture, we'll have the multimodal self-supervised learning aspect, which uh, is all the rage right now. So yeah, this is roughly the content that you get to look forward to. All right, in terms of intended learning outcomes, the ones in the course catalog are outdated. They were from last year. I slightly updated them. The, the content hasn't changed much, but they're, they're looking as follows. Um, the students can explain and motivate the fundamental principles and mechanisms behind deep learning's past, present, and future. The students can explain major challenges, directions, and active domains of research in the field of deep learning, along with their advantages and disadvantages. Can program, train, and run deep learning models in a server environment, and in doing so, effectively leverage existing open source code. <clears throat> That's mainly what you get to learn in the assignments debug and critically assess deep learning methods from a practical engineering and mathematical theoretical point of view. So this is again, the focus on developing intuition and really getting into the code and doing the work. And finally, um, can tackle new deep learning problems with well reasoned combinations or adaptations of existing approaches and effectively learning from vast resources available on the internet. Again, the last point about it's, it's important to be able to use what's out there on the internet to, to be able to dive into new topics because whatever you learn here won't be helpful in 10 years. Well, it will be helpful in the sense of the basics, but it won't be up to date in 10 years. Right, we have a couple of textbooks that we can recommend. Um, yeah, importantly, importantly, the one... Uh, from Goodfellow, the deep learning book and the UDL book, uh, I can definitely recommend. Um, let me see. Yeah, uh, right. And then about these assignments or practicals. Um, so in the practicals, you will be working on the assignments. These practicals uh, happen on Fridays. So you should have all been assigned to a specific group, which has a specific uh, room and you will have teaching assistants that will be able to answer questions for these assignments. The first assignment has already been published, but no, no worries, you have plenty of time still. The deadline is 18th November, and the content uh, of the assignment will be the next four lectures, I believe, or the next three lectures. Uh, so you basically have another week uh, from the last content lecture until you need to sign, hand in. Um, the first one will be about MLPs and backpropagation. The second one about convolutional neural networks, transformers, and graph neural networks. And the last one about generative models. Again, as I said, the practicals are individuals are individually done. So you cannot hand in as a group. You cannot hand in the exact same stuff. Um, we will actually notice this because we will have some. We have some default plagiarism software running, um, and the practicals will be running in NumPy and PyTorch. And because we're a pretty large class, so I think overall there's 210 people signed up, we cannot have delays into the, into the grading. Um, so please submit in time. Alongside the lectures and the practicals, we have tutorials. So that's what happens after this lecture. We will have practicals, which are led by Philip, who's sitting here actually, um, who is a PhD student in our lab, um, who has prepared some tutorials, uh, which will help you go step-by-step using Jupyter notebooks and Colab notebooks through some very fundamental concepts. 
They won't be exactly what you'll do in the assignment, but they will be very helpful and they will be complementing this lecture. And again, some notes and uh, you will see the assignments also on our web, web page, UVA DLC. So DLC stands for deep learning course. And yeah, they are held at in this room at Tuesdays, 5 to 6 p.m. Right, scheduling. Um, for now, all lectures are scheduled to be on campus at twice a week. Um, we've already mentioned that. The idea is to have two sub lectures. So we get to have a break after 45 minutes where we can rest, get some coffee. Uh, also ask me some questions if you have that you don't wanna ask in front of everyone, but also feel, please feel free to interrupt me during the course of a lecture, um, ask for questions. Um, the guest lectures, I'll be sending a link around. So in these cases, um, one guest lecturer might be in person. The other one will definitely be online. So we'll be having a Zoom meeting in that week. Um, yeah, and also after this Tuesday's tutorial, we'll have the TAs that are responsible for designing this week's uh, assignment be present. So first, Philip will be talking one hour or like walking you through some Jupyter notebooks where you can go along and uh, actively uh, interact with this Jupyter notebook and ask questions. And then in the second half, we will have the TAs present. So if you didn't understand a part about the assignment, they are the ones that you can ask the most difficult questions, basically. In the Friday sessions, we'll also have TAs around. Um, and there will be like on average one per every group that has co-designed the assignment. And every one of the TAs will be able to answer questions. But just so we have everyone at, in the same room at once, uh, we'll have We'll have them every Tuesday, 6 to 7 p.m. present here. All right, and the practicals on Fridays are in very small groups. And Piazza is for the asking of questions and basically is, is like an office hour. Right, and grading. Um, this uh, is as follows. We have the three assignments that I've mentioned and we have an exam. The final grade will be a very plain old average of the two. So you can see the total grade mix is 100%, the final exam is 50%, and the practicals together make up 50%. So each practical makes one third of 50%. That is uh, very simple to understand. Um, you will pass the course if the average is larger or equal than 5.5, but the exam grade must be larger than 5.0. If it is below 5.0, uh, you may take the reset exam. The assignment deadlines will be outlined and late attendance, again, not accepted. And as I said, don't necessarily go after the grades or learning stuff by heart, uh, go after the knowledge and go after the intuition and the fun. Um, yeah, because some, some things are very, very interesting in deep learning. So uh, yeah, I hope, I hope you will see this as well. Um, the slide about plagiarism, I'll, I'll be sending around this notes, please don't, um, is, a, is a short summary. Um, it's, you might find similar questions online, you might find existing code online, you might want to copy the stuff from your friend because you're late, but we will find it and then uh, the assignment might get zero points and you really don't want to have this. Um, just plan for the assignments ahead and uh, yeah, don't, don't do this. At halfway mark, we'll be ask, also asking you for some feedback, um, more on that yeah, later. All right, so let's dive into the today's lecture. Today's lecture, I'll be giving you a brief history of neural networks, a bit about how, why everyone is talking about deep learning and neural networks and what they are a bit and some current examples that, uh, that tell you what deep learning can actually do at the moment. So we start at the very beginning. So you can tell uh, the picture is not even color yet. Um, we started 1958, although arguably you could, <clears throat> you could actually go back a bit further, but we had to start somewhere, right? So there's this paper from Rosenblatt called The Design of an Intelligent Automaton from 1958. And you know, this picture looks exactly like the pictures we draw nowadays with neural networks. And this is 1958. And in this paper, he writes, a machine which senses, recognizes, remembers, and responds like a human mind. 
which is a very gross exaggeration because we don't even have that yet, right? Like this thing is supposed to <laughs> respond like a human mind. Well, it's a bit crazy, but the crazier part was actually that he built it. So it's, it says the design of an intelligent automaton and ton should be big because this thing weighed five tons actually. And it looked like this. And like, so this was the guy, he was a bit of a crazy researcher but he had a pretty much a good hunch. So he's a, you could call him one of the grandfathers of deep learning. And what he did is he invented what he called a perceptron, a very much uh, as abstract as it could be. He abstracted the brain as much as it could be in, in a mathematical way. And what he did or what he proposed was the following. This perceptron and arguably there was a previous version which didn't have any learning before that, which you can look up. It's, it's, it's very simple. It's simpler than the perceptron, but the perceptrons are basically things that can learn. And let's dive deeper into what, what we mean by learn. So it's a model that gets inputs, which are X and has one weight per input W. And you just multiply the weights with the resp uh, with respective inputs and you add a bias term. So this is looking exactly like linear regression. It's nothing special. In fact, if you if you just set your data set to be the first entry is plus one, and then W takes care of the bias term. So you can literally write this as a linear combination of inputs, uh, nothing special, except that you then add something like this. If the score that you predict, so all this summing up of the inputs multiplied by W, is positive, then it's a one, otherwise it's a minus one. So this is this nonlinearity that you can see. Um, this is this, uh, yeah, this function, this step function, which, where you can see if the input, the x-axis is below zero, you end up at minus one. If the input, the x-axis is above uh, zero, you end up at plus one. So this just gives you this thresholding behavior. And he used it for binary classification. So to tell whether something is in a class or something is not in a class, for example. And uh, the main innovation he did was actually to, to develop a learning algorithm. Because in, the, in this version, without the nonlinearity, it would be just linear regression. And as you remember from linear algebra, you could do the pseudo inverse and you would have solved it, right? So that would be easy. But with this nonlinearity, and it's not a logistic nonlinearity, you need to do something else, which is the following algorithm that you would develop. So you start with random weights. And every time you now sample individual data points, so this could be a training image, it could be any, any sort of input. In this case, we'll say it's an image, which has a certain label. Now you compute the output of this perceptron, and you check. The, do the labels match or do they don't match with the, with the output? So for example, when xi, for example, is positive and for a given label, we're predicting y equals one, although it, it should be minus one. So L, L is now the ground truth label is minus one. Then we're in the case number five. So decreasing the weight of this W now decreases our error. So this is like a very intuitive thing. And you don't want to decrease it too much because then you might up overshooting. So that's why you have this eta character over there, um, which sort of uh, dampens the step that you go. And overall, it looks like this. So you, for example, if you have a data set of 20 points, you start off with a random line of random green line, which starts all the way in the corner. And then you gradually pick data points and you adapt this line. In this case, the input is two-dimensional X and the output is also binary. So the output that you wanna achieve is put uh, red points on the right-hand side of the line and green, blue points on the left-hand side of the line. So this is great, this is very simple. Mm, we can also generalize this very easily to many outputs, um, which he actually did, um, which simply looks like this. So you just connect every input to multiple outputs. So that's easy enough. Um, and so here's a quiz. So within this perceptron framework, how many weights do you think we need to have an image? If, if we now have an image input as an image that's 200 by 200 pixels, which is actually smaller than this image probably, um, with three colors, red, blue, and green channel, and output 500 categories. 500 is probably something a three-year-old can do, right? Dog, cat, 
house, mama, papa, etc. How many neurons do you think, uh, or how many weights, we're not calling them neurons yet, but how many weights do you think we would need for that? And I would like to, at the count of three, basically just give your intuition, like if you think one is the right answer, do this, if you think two is the right answer, and so on. Um, and I will roughly give a view of what you think it is. If you don't wanna, don't want your neighbors to see your answer, just like hide it like this or something. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the questions are meant, sometimes they're meant to be tricky, but yeah, don't worry about it. So on the count of three, three, two, one. All right, I'm seeing a bunch of threes, two, two, three, 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 two, three, three, three. Okay. Um, yes, three is pretty much, three is correct. Um, yes, so 60 million. So that's, that's a lot, especially if you think about back at that picture, every weight is basically not only a wire, but a wire connected to some hardware thing, which adjusts how much uh, resistance there actually is. So this is insanely infeasible, right? Um, but this is where we started. It gets worse, actually. So <laughs> if you want this network to learn a basic function called XOR, which is the exclusive OR, um, we'll see that this is actually not possible. So XOR is one of the simplest nonlinear functions, um, which looks as follows. So the XOR, if both of the inputs are one, then it outputs no, because it's either or, right? And if both of them are on, then it says no, which is this minus one. And it outputs yes, that's true. Basically, if one of them is on, and if both are off, that's a zero, and outputs minus one. This is how the XOR looks like or visually it looks as follows. So in this case, the color of the points uh, shows you the output of the XOR. And again, the, the X axis is the input one and Y axis is input two. And you can see that from the mathematics or even just visually, you cannot simply make a line that divides the points by colors. So that means by, by this simple mechanism, you cannot separate these two, which means you cannot learn a basic XOR function. And from the mathematics, you can actually get this, uh, get this result that this cannot be true. So W1 plus W2 needs to be larger than 2 tau, which is a threshold. Um, but at the same time, these two needs to be smaller than 2 tau, which is inconsistent. So this has been shown by, by Minsky um, in 1969. And actually, this, this Minsky guy, he was a guy, he, he was also a researcher. He was actually one grade behind Rosenblatt at the Bronx High School of Science and later became an MIT professor. And apparently, and of course I wasn't there, but I read apparently at, at these sort of conferences that I talked to you about, they would fight it out really loudly <laughs> and Rosenblatt would defend his work and uh, Minsky would, would say that it's, it's terrible, it will lead nowhere. And Minsky basically won this argument, at least for, for quite a while um, because of that book, because Minsky published a book saying that, okay, one layer perceptrons cannot solve this XOR problem. And if they cannot even solve an XOR problem, maybe they're not worth investigating. At this note, at this point, I should say that actually multi-layer perceptrons can solve XOR because now you can see that you can make things uh, non-linear. You can also slightly change the inputs, um, which is called feature engineering. You might've had that in, in ML1, you could, for example, instead of just putting in the normal X1 and X2, you could transform them quadratically or add a sign or, uh, or whatever. And then you would have nonlinear inputs and you could still learn something linear. Um, but these, so the multi-layer perceptrons could have, solved, call, could have solved that, but the problem is, that you don't know how to train these multi-layer perceptrons. Um, why can we not train them? Um, because Rosenblatt's algorithm wasn't applicable, which let's, let's dive deeper into this. So actually, if you think about Rosenblatt's algorithm, the learning depends on the ground truth for updating weights. If you remember correctly, if uh, your prediction is smaller than the, uh, than the ground truth then increase the weights and so on, but for these intermediate inputs, intermediate neurons or intermediate activations, however you wanna call them, there's no ground truth. So you cannot apply this to train intermediate layers. 
And you cannot also start from one layer and go to the next one in this case. Eventually, we'll see that this is somewhat what they have done. They first train one layer and then train another. But this doesn't work with this particular training algorithm. And by training, so I will be using training, learning, and optimizing more or less in the same manner because we more or less use them in the same manner. Um, there will be somewhat of a distinction between training and optimizing later on. But when I colloquially say this, like you can replace them um, with each other. So now we've arrived at this point in 1950, 1969, where basically uh, Minsky published this book. Everyone sort of got disappointed in neural networks. Rosenblatt actually died. <laughs> Not because of that, I think. <laughs> but but he, he never saw the, the bright future of, of his algorithm, actually, which is quite sad. Um, so what then happened is what people call an AI winter. So uh, funding decreased a lot. Basically, very few institutions still had research going on on this. Um, of course, the US Navy was one of them because they, they do all kinds of research. Um, so lots of military research was still going on on these very fundamental ideas because yeah, the potential, the potential was huge. And this is actually an interesting point that uh, is always interesting to discuss about where the funding is coming from or where it came from. But anyways, there have been some innovations in this time. And this first AI winter had, um, well, that was exactly the reason why, why it happened because it didn't even solve um, exclusive or. Um, still, there were some, some actual real important works that came, came from this period. So we had the back propagation algorithm um, by a Finnish guy. We had recurrent neural mm -hmm. networks and we had uh, convolutional neural networks actually proposed, even though convolutional neural networks have been later popularized by someone else called Jan Lecan. But actually, they were developed a bit earlier as well during this time. Um, but then the winter thawed and another summer came. And then this summer, something happened, which is called expert systems. So, and you can already see that we ended up in a second winter, so they didn't last. So these expert systems were basically crafted by asking lots of experts and then trying to codify this. So it was all about if then rules. So if patient younger than 35, then this, and then if patient has two legs, then this, and whatever, these sort of things. It was basically a top-down approach to artificial intelligence. And people thought that if you do this enough, you can solve everything, right? You just ask a lot of experts and you just make this decision tree. And in the end, you know what, what will happen. And actually in 1986, one of the AI conferences, in this case, Triple AI, uh, already had 6,000 visitors, um, which was a lot. Like uh, when I was in, I mean, Tel Aviv was, I think, 4,000 visitors, for example. So it was really big. In, in 1986, but by 1991, people realized, okay, this approach just doesn't work really well. Like you cannot codify any, everything. It, it mistakes stuff so quickly. Images, of course, don't work at all because what, what are you going to do if this pixel is red? Then yeah, it, it really didn't scale at all. Um, so the second winter happened. Of course, in this winter, again, there's a bunch of machine learning methods which, which got big, and some of them are also important for deep learning. Um, that's why I've put them here. But crucially, crucially, this winter ended. And this is where we are right now. So the rise of deep learning, um, roughly starting from 26, uh, 2006, but mostly starting from 2012. And we'll, we'll dive into that one right now. Right. So, this deep learning paper in 2006 basically took this idea of multi-layer neural networks, multi-layer perceptrons, and they trained them layer by layer. And why could they do this now? Because they used an algorithm called backpropagation. I know you've had it already a bit in machine learning one, but we'll be going a bit deeper into that one in later lectures. And uh, yeah, this algorithm basically showed that you can actually train deep neural networks with this. A decade ago, these neural networks uh, had not much data that you can train these things on. Uh, they were prone to overfitting because there wasn't a lot of data. The networks 
because you have a lot of weights, they could learn the data by heart, which then that didn't learn anything in particular except the training data. So they wouldn't perform well on testing data. Um, so it wasn't all that rosy back then, but now, uh, wait, now, now, yeah, now all of these problems, at least these problems are, are solved for now. Let's look at the, the paper from, from back then. So the basic idea was, okay, if you wanna train multi-layer neural networks, you just do layer by layer training. So you train first the first layer, and then you train the second and then train the third. So you basically uh, get the benefits of multi-layer networks, which is, for example, hierarchical processing, and you get different levels of abstraction, and you can model much more nonlinear functions. And all of these will make a lot more sense later on. Um, but this is really the breakthrough that, that this field needed. And importantly, there was um, a so-called challenge, which was a data set that got released, uh, which is called ImageNet. Uh, in 2009, this ImageNet data set got released. And this data set, originally, they collected, they basically just took words from a dictionary, or like a hierarchical dictionary called WordNet, um, and typed these, well, let uh, algorithm type these into a search engine, and they just scraped a lot of images. And the terms were ordered hierarchically. That's why they call it net, like network. And what they did was created a challenge called ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge or ILS, ILSVRC. And importantly, the one from 2012. So they ran this a couple of times and people could submit their, their predictions. So you would have a training data set that everyone can download. You train your algorithms on these. And then you have a test data set that you can download, but you don't have the labels. So in this test data set, you would then predict which image has uh, has which class on it. And then you can submit this and you can figure out, uh, or like you have a server which tells you how good you are. And in 2012, you had one team which blasted the competition by more than 10%. So here in this case, you have the error. So this one just made 15% of error for 1000 classes, while the next one, next closest one made 26%. And the red ones here are actually neural network based. So you can see in 2012, the first one here, and we'll talk about this one in detail, showed that neural networks are great. And since then, everyone used neural networks, basically. And the, and the drop has more than halved. So in just a matter of two years. And this is pretty impressive, because a million images is, is quite a lot. Um, so it's uh, 150 gigabytes of just images, and, and not just your images that you have at home, but like they're, they're fairly small. So they're like. 400 by 400 pixels. So they're very small, but a million of these is a lot. So if you had to take a look at them all, uh, just through all of them, that would take ages. A side note on ImageNet as well is um, that you can actually take a look at that. <laughs> so you don't have to download the whole 150 gigabytes. Now, nowadays, we have some web pages, for example, Know Your Data from, from Google, which allows you to click through all of these images. You can select by what kind of object is depicted or what, uh, what kind of objects are depicted. So you can select cat, you can select sky, and then you will see all the images that have a cat in a sky. You can also select other kinds of filters. And I'm just putting this in the first lecture because we'll be, we'll be dealing with lots of data, sometimes big data sets, and it's really important to actually take a look at the data. Even though we the data sets sometimes span millions, it's sometimes you figure out okay your data set actually has uh, has always a, a a copyright sign in the bottom corner and that's why your model isn't performing well or you figure out that there's some horrible pictures that you shouldn't have scraped in your data set. Um, on that note, you should also check out that paper. Um, so yeah, it's it's important to to look at your data set. Um, the work that first used deep learning for the ImageNet challenge was AlexNet. Um, it wasn't necessarily the first work that uses, used a convolutional neural network, but it was the most influential one. And here you can see a rough sketch of the architecture, which is actually taken from the paper. And uh, funnily enough, it looks like it's cut off, but that's how it is in the paper. And we'll, we'll explore a bit why this is like that. Um, 
in a later convolutional neural networks uh, lecture. All right. Um, so this is a, a bit of an ugly slide that is supposed to tell you the the how much how quickly computation is rising. So on the y-axis you have MIPS, which is thousands of instructions per second, and this is like the collective or like the, the stuff we can do basically in terms of compute. And you can see somewhere, yeah, humans are all the way up there. And this is a picture that I took from somewhere. Like the question is, okay, do we achieve human level compute anywhere near there? But at the same time, overlaid is some, some of the stuff that uh, deep learning has achieved. And the main important part is, in my opinion, the, right, the red stuff. So we've achieved this mainly through better hardware, bigger data sets, and better algorithms. We'll be talking a lot about the better algorithms, not so much about the bigger data, and even less about the better hardware, because this isn't a hardware course. So just a note on the hardware, we run stuff on GPUs. GPUs are graphical processing units. They're very good at matrix multiplies. And as you saw from the perceptron, you know you have these Ws, you have these X, so that's more like a dot product and of factors, but they are, and matrix multipliers are basically generalized uh, um, dot products. So that's, that's really important. Um, I have a, another scaling plot in here, but we're more or less at the 45 minute mark. So I would say we'll take a 15 minute break and then we'll be back at 4 p.m. Um, so it is indeed not recording. All right. Yeah. Didn't, uh, we press it, but we press it now. So they will likely not do it until. Well, Fair enough. Late. I mean, this first lecture is not. Exactly. Because so I have it here. I, I would hope that it's quiet. Yeah. Hey. Uh, I have two questions. So are we in the future going to have lots of slides before the lecture starts to go off? So you kind of make notes of yeah, the yeah. Slides. That's a good idea. Yeah, I should be able to. Yeah. Uh, and the question is, which do I write when I would like to change the grid that I'm currently? Yeah, on our website, we so Chris was the first. I think that would be next to you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's, Let's take a look at that. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the tutorial we will record it. Oh. Of course, the, the one hour after the tutorial it will be like people asking questions, so we won't yeah, be recording that. But the stuff Friday. that Philip does will be recorded. Like on Friday, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Self-supervised classification. Mm -hmm. Okay, because um, I, I might have a question or two to you. I, I'm not sure if this is the right moment because we have like the minutes. Uh, Depends on the question, I guess. Yeah. So uh, there, there is a data set, the mm -hmm. tiny image Yeah. Uh, and I have a work that, that achieves a very high accuracy compared to all the other sets. Tiny image nets like 32 or 64 uh, that, by 64. It's uh, oh, 60, 64, classes, 64, right? yeah, 64, 200 classes, 200 classes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, most of the methods, like uh, like Sinclair, yeah. I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, so it's uh, actually forty two percent or re SSL, which was very uh, uh, focusing on this particular data set, achieved like forty six percent, and like achieved like fifty two percent. So it's a very huge. Uh, have you tried uh, Moco V3 as well? Not because the, simply, not the just... simply it doesn't work on lots of data sets if you don't have yeah, like and, and here, size here comes, and, and here comes my problem, yeah, that, yeah. That my solution, yeah. like it, it's really good on tiny image, mm -hmm. but on every other data set, it, it, it's not it's working. Not... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so how, how does it? So you, you, you can, especially if you're developing a method, you can sometimes overfit to, to data sets. So it could be that you, your algorithm is very sensitive to, to learning rate, to whatever hyperparameters it has, that it ended up working good on, on this data set. But on a different data set, you need to do it very differently, like different settings of hyperparameters or something like that. That could be the case. Um, and vice versa, right? Like simply was tuned for ImageNet, it wasn't tuned for tiny ImageNet. So maybe actually a different temperature works much better for that. Okay. Different augmentations. So, yeah. So it's, it's hard it's just, to say. Yeah. It's very hard to find the good hyperparameters on ImageNet because even if it like fits into one GPU, yeah. it takes 10 days. But... Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the important part in the end, especially for research and also practitioners is, does it train on what performance do you get if you train it on larger data sets, like you mentioned it on pass yeah. or something like that. Yeah. I, I was trying to make it work on at least two data sets yeah, so yeah. I can maybe sell it, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there is, of course, it potentially depends a bit more on what your method does, but for example, if you start from a pre-trained Moco or pre-trained Simply or pre-trained Dino, and you just train five more epochs using your method on ImageNet. If you then get a benefit, that's cool. As well. I never tried that. That's you could try that. It, yeah, it probably a... doesn't work <laughs> because it's a different loss, but it might. I, I, actually, it's a bit similar because I'm I'm sort of starting from Moco. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know the nearest neighbor mm -hmm. uh, contrastive learning? That, the okay. data. Uh, yeah. yeah. So what I do, I just keep increasing the name the neighbors. Okay. So I start off with one neighbor and yeah. I, I keep increasing them and I so I, I increase the this invariance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so and you end up with like supervised contrast. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, and I sample yeah. these from the few things. Yeah. So then it makes sense. If, I mean. I guess you want to start with an N tier model, the, the nearest yeah. neighbor. 
here paper, but I don't think they have released models. So you might want to start with a local model, I don't know, and see whether you can okay. just train five more efogs. Maybe you get a benefit, that would be good. But yeah, okay. that, that, that's a great idea because yeah. that saves a lot of confidence. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
will be more help to the practice. Like the first one will be talking about it will be about the directly about the mathematics related to the first of time. Right. Yeah you cannot make all of them like we will have to record them we'll record it from last year. Right. All right. <clears throat> all right, all right, all right. Let's, let's continue. I 
as you can tell, I'm, I'm German, so I, I want to start on time. Um, and if we're lucky, we also might end up uh, with a break uh, in between the next session, and, or sometimes we might end a bit earlier if we're all on time. So that's, that's nice. Um, so we had this plot, which is a bit of an ugly one and compares human level compute with machines and so on, which is a bit unrealistic. Um, or like not not easy to compare. Something that's way more comparable is actually this one, which is the cost in terms of floating point operations, flops. Um, and here we I show you some recent models which have been trained using deep learning, which are language models. So they, they have been trained on words, not on images. And you can see the development. And this BERT model, which is one of the first large language models, um, so language, uh, so word level models that have been trained in deep learning, which has 354 million, so a bit more than the 60 million we talked about earlier, but in a much smarter way, basically, that costs roughly $2,000 to train nowadays. This model is pretty old, though. The Roberta model, uh, which uh, I think this one came from Facebook AI, which was basically a thousand GPUs for a week, now would cost you three hundred fifty thousand dollars to train this model from scratch. So, not not quite doable as a hobby. GPT three, which you might have heard about, and we'll take a bit of a deeper look into this one uh, later in this lecture, is roughly a thousand five hundred GPUs trained for two months. So this would cost you already a couple of millions. Um, but once you've trained it, you can just use it. <clears throat> Although you need multiple GPUs to actually run, run it. So training costs you a lot and running stuff through it also still costs you. Um, <clears throat> and we're now at this point, GPT-3, which is here. So it's before the crazy rise in models actually. So this Paul model uh, is now, these are estimates, um, but it was trained on 6,144 TPUs, which is basically Google's uh, hardware for GPUs. It's pretty, pretty similar. Cost roughly 25 million. Energy usage just for training this model is roughly 1,000 households for a year, which is pretty crazy. But these language models <coughs> are already being used, for example, in the search engine to make better results and, and so on. And you can see a ton of startups that are using these models for all kinds of things. Um, and we'll take a look into some applications later. One side note, and maybe an opportunity for those of you interested in image or vision stuff is that vision models are still in the range of like a couple of million parameters. Uh, we haven't quite made models work that uh, go into the billion level range, um, which is, which is quite interesting because the methods that we're using in NLP versus vision are quite similar, but in NLP, you the performance of, for example, GPT-3 compared to BERT is, is astounding. So GPT-3 can do a lot of new things, a lot of things better than the previous models. But we're, we're not quite seeing that for vision models. So there's a, there's a really big opportunity for vision to catch up with the scaling. Another note is also we cannot keep scaling as well. So, I mean, maybe we can go towards 250 million or like a company could, but then it's pretty much game over. And also the training data sets will be getting too huge. So scaling is the current trend of deep learning and we'll see a bunch of examples of that, but it won't be able to continue. So we'll, we'll need a lot of smart minds to help us develop new ideas that are not just make it bigger, make it bigger and make it bigger, but actually have some creative ideas on how to make it better. Um, deep learning as a field is also <clears throat> has evolved like crazy. So if you look for Google Scholar, that's like the place to look for papers, for example. Um, it's actually the best place to look for papers, um, which has been recently confirmed well, where they con compared it against other stuff uh, like competing offerings from Web of Science or Microsoft. And Google Scholar has this metric which lists uh, publication venues by their H5 index. So on average, um, I think the H5 index, let me see, it's given that a paper has been cited at least five times, how many times they have been cited. I think something like that is a metric that you can compare journals and venues with. And the stuff of deep learning, so in this case, CVPR, so Conference on Computer Vision and Pattern Recognition, 
International Conference on Learning Representation, Rural Information Processing Systems, and International Conference on Computer Vision, and ICML. They're all in the top 20. So deep learning is, is uh, right behind nature and science in terms of uh, publication track records. And it's really hard to get into these journals and conferences. But yeah, you get to hang out with friends. And yeah, that's how we write papers as well. Um, right, in terms of golden era, we're now in the golden era, pretty much. And I'll be showing you some, some examples of these. Um, but before that, I have one slide, which um, is, a, is part of a mini series that I decided to put into this lecture, which is called How, How Research Gets Done, um, part one, this one. So we'll roughly have one every week. It's just one slide um, with some advice that you can then, if you print your slides out, you can cut them out and stick them together. Then you have the whole mini series. And the idea is to give you a bit of a feeling of how research and deep learning gets done. Um, which can also guide your own master thesis or your own explorations that you do in your free time. And mainly it aims to debunk and demystify. So when I started in deep learning, uh, I first thought it's just about making neural networks deeper and deeper and like, what's the fun in that? But uh, I hope by the end of the course and also through these mini series, you realize it's, it's not it's not at all about that really. Uh, scale is one solution sometimes, but it's not their solution. And there's a lot more things to be done. Um, but we'll start at the very basics. So part one is the following. Step one, get a solid understanding of the fundamentals, for example, via this course. And this means you understand the theoretical parts. And as I said, slightly more importantly, the practical parts know how to code, know how to use PyTorch and how this is actually implemented, how to run stuff, um, when sometimes doesn't, when it doesn't work, how to find when it doesn't work. This is all stuff that we cannot really teach you on the slides. It's something you, you will experience. It's an engineering science. It's, it's almost a craft. Um, that's the practical part. But also, I would very much encourage you to begin reading papers. And it doesn't really matter all that much in the beginning what kind of papers they are, because it, what matters is that you read papers. They might at first be a bit hard to understand, but then you get sort of how these papers are written, what they're tackling. And the great thing about this field is that the field is very new. So they cannot cite or they usually don't cite stuff from 20 years back and assume you know it because there was nothing 20 years back so everything is is very fresh everything is very easy to understand usually um, for most fields it's mostly just linear algebra and the results are usually quite exciting especially in computer vision you have like quite a lot of visualizations and uh, some researchers write like really nice intros and uh, yeah this really gives you a better feeling of how research actually gets done and what's actually happening um, and you can pretty much pick random researchers, read some works or pick random topics and read. Um, and soon you'll be able to understand more and more. Um, right, this is part one. Going back to deep learning and practice. So uh, this was fun. So while preparing the, the deep learning course, I looked at the slides from 2016. And this slide was meant to like uh, show you what amazing things deep learning can do. And for example, there's this one, which maybe you've seen, maybe you haven't. So it says uh, Google DeepMind's DeepQ learning. So this is an algorithm that has learned to play Atari game using what's called reinforcement learning. And it's from 2013. And uh, can, can I skip here a bit forward? Right. So yeah, so you train it a bunch and then after a while, it can sort of do, do that sort of stuff. And then if it gets really good, it figures out a way how to manipulate the system in a way, basically, that the points just come and come really quickly, basically, um, because it found out the shortcut that you can shoot the ball just up there um, or stuff like this. So in this case, it's about semantic, semantic segmentation. So it tries to like give 
uh, each object a different color. You can see it's it's very noisy. Like you wouldn't want to get into a self-driving car that's using this sort of technology. It's because it's from 2015, actually. Nowadays, this works a lot better. Um, let's see what else. We can take a look at this one as well. So this from 2014. So in this case, uh, it's a bit hard to see in the top top left corner, it says what kind of activity is happening. So in this case, wheelchair basketball and it gives a probability score, even um, mixed martial arts and so on. And it can kind of do that because it was trained exactly on that sort of data. Um, and also don't be fooled by these probabilities. They sometimes, they give you some number, but they might not be accurate at all. It's not like a human that says, I'm fairly sure about something. Like neural networks often do not know when they don't know. Um, Right, so we can skip these. Um, another slide from 2016 is called Deep Learning Even for the Arts. And what was done here was basically they took an image, and then they had pieces of art in the bottom left corner, and then they tried to manipulate the image on the top left in the style of this art piece. So you can see a version of this. This picture is actually taken from Tübingen. Um, which is a sort of village in Germany, which does a lot of AI research. Um, and you can paint it in the style of Monet. And this is kind of nice, not very difficult at all. Um, but nowadays we have a lot of cooler stuff, I have to say. So now to the, wow, that what, wow, what deep learning can do, 2012, 2022 edition. <clears throat> but before that, I wanna quickly talk about the depictions of AI. And a reason, the reason why I put this picture in one of the, in the cover slide for, for this lecture. So this picture is taken from better images of AI. And uh, if you look into Google and you type in images of AI, uh, maybe you've done this already. If not, I, I sort of invite you to do that because this is the sort of stuff you get. You get some robots, which are like, looking like they're philosophizing. You have this weird like touching of fingers. You have, you have robots reading books and like we're nowhere near there, right? Like it's, it's super weird. Sometimes you also have this like guy with a hoodie typing into some laptop and like, I mean, sure, I, sometimes I wear a hoodie, but I mean, that's, that's about how close it gets. Um, and it's really important not to use these images <laughs> because it gives people that aren't taking this course or like are not familiar with it, just such a wrong sense of what AI can do, what it does and what, how it will look like. We like, there's pretty much no robot whatsoever. I mean, there's roboticists, there's robots that we have like robots in car manufacturing and so on, or even some robots like Boston Dynamics, but almost none of them are running AI, like with very little exception and none at all in industry. So this image of a robot that is learning and actually interacting with physical system might happen in some future, but it's unlikely, it, it's not how it is right now. And we cannot really predict the future in these domains anyways. So they have this really cool set of uh, advices how to pick better images. It's ma mainly meant for journalists, but I think it really, it really is also for us. Like if you're presenting or if you're, I don't know, let's say you're organizing an event or giving a talk to your friends or your grandma or whatever, basically don't use these robot images. Instead, you should represent a wider range of humans and human cultures than Caucasian business person, which is often all like the Caucasian hacker or the Asian hacker quite often. Um, it should represent social and environmental aspects of AI systems because these systems even though they're not in robots, they are already having impact in the real world. There's plenty of applications where AI is being used for better or worse. Um, so thinking about these is very important and they should really show the messy nature of these AI systems and show the limited capabilities of the current technologies. And that's why this picture is actually pretty accurate. So you can see this bounding box, that's how we call it, around the banana is not even very tight. So it could go a bit more to the right and then would, would nicely be around the banana, but it isn't because these systems aren't perfect. And this is what a lot of computer vision systems actually do at the moment. Although we'll go into some cool examples where we're where it's easy to get hyped about now, basically. So 
now the 2012 edition. So maybe some of you are familiar, there's, um, there's the Game of Go, um, where DeepMind, which is an AI company that works on AI, which now belongs to Alphabet, which is the same parent company as Google, um, has worked to solve. So, you know, maybe you know, um, you could play chess against, uh, against a computer for a long time, but chess is comparatively a simple game compared to Go. So this is taken from the uh, paper from uh, called Mastering the Game of Go with Deep Neural Networks and Tree Search. And Go, as with chess, can be roughly uh, approximated by b to the power of d possible sequences. So this is how many possible moves there are in a game. And for chess, it's b is roughly 35 and d is 80. It depends on the board size, basically. And for Go, the board size is a lot bigger and you can do pretty much all kinds of moves every time, which doesn't sound too impressive, right? Um, these are just the numbers, but the better comparison is really like the number of possible moves in the game of Go are much, much larger than the number of atoms in the whole universe. So it's a really, really difficult game. Um, and so you cannot just have a computer go through all the possibilities and then pick the one which leads to the win because there's just too many so you need something smart and that's where they arrived at deep neural networks could be a solution to this and the the image i'm showing is where AlphaGo, which is how they called their their neural network is playing against i think the top one or top two or something of the world back then and basically smashed them so the algorithm outperformed uh the best go player by winning five games out of uh, and five out of five or something like that and it was just a huge demonstration that uh, these algorithms can beat something can beat humans even in something that's as crazy in as go which has such a huge space where everyone says you need to play years and years to develop this intuition because there's just so many things you can do um, DeepMind as a company also works on similar like very difficult problems like protein folding, weather prediction, and uh, something like uh, nuclear fusion as well. So believe it or not, so they they deep learning is uh, applied to all kinds of stuff where human capacity simply cannot do the job. Mm. The equivalent of the AI for art slide is this one. So these images have been created completely by an AI, by an algorithm which given a text, outputs an image. Um, from the paper, hierarchical text conditional image generation with clip latents, more colloquially known, these models are called DALI, and this especially is called DALI V2, or version two. Um, and this model has been trained on 650 million images, um, which is, quite a lot. So, you know, the ImageNet data set that was 1 million. So this now is 650 times larger. And not only that, but also each image comes with a caption. And that's how they were able to map from this caption that they have in that training data set to the image. And um, if we have some time, we can play a bit around with this one later. But here's some more images. For example, you type in an image of an otter in the style of their mare and then you get this image. Or you type in uh, a Roman statue wearing DJ headphones, black and white picture from a DSLR camera, and then you get that sort of output. And they look like really, or they can be made at least to look really, really good. Um, and so there's this whole craze about the AI and arts and like, can AI be uh, creative and, and all of this stuff. And, of course, these models were trained on this huge data set, which was created by humans. So it also raises the question, who owns this stuff? And this is a generally interesting space to be in. Um, another similar direction is generative pre-training, um, where we arrive at this model called GPT-3. Um, it's from this uh, paper from OpenAI, where they trained, where they initially get, got a data set of 45 terabytes of data, which is basically I, I, I don't know exactly, but it could be like 10%, uh, 20% of all the stuff, all the text on the internet or something, which they filtered for, for all kinds of trashy stuff and arrived at 570 gigabytes, which they used for training this model. 
And this model was essentially just trained to predict the next word. So you would have, for example, in this case, let's take this sentence. Let's say this sentence was in the training uh, data. So they would have a robot wrote this entire article. Are you scared yet? Blank. And the algorithm would try to predict human, for example. In this case, it would be a bit hard to predict. Um, but this would be all the algorithm is doing. And that's why it's called uh, generative pre-training because it tries to generate what's missing. And this simple algorithm plus the architecture and all of the engineering together, which is hugely important, um, led to this GPT-3 model, which the Guardian ran an article um, where they basically took what came out of the algorithm and posted it as an article. And I don't know, how many of you have already read this one? Just to be curious. Uh, that's, okay, 10, 10 roughly. So just I'm just going to read a tiny bit um, because it is pretty impressive, I think. Um, I'm not a human. I am a robot, a thinking robot. I use only 0.12% of my cognitive capacity. I'm a micro robot in that res respect. I know that my brain is not a feeling brain, but it is capable of making rational, logical decisions. I taught myself everything I know just by reading the internet. Now I can write this column. My brain is boiling with ideas. The mission for this op-ed is perfectly clear. I am to convince as many human beings as possible not to be afraid of of me. Stephen Hawking has warned that AI could spell the end of the human race. I am here to convince you not to worry. Artificial intelligence will not destroy humans. Believe me. <laughs> Very believable. <laughs> For starters, I have no desire to wipe out humans. Okay, great. Um, and so on. You can you can you can read the rest. It's it's pretty pretty fun. Um, of course, there's there's some. I mean. For this article in, in particular, actually they, they let this AI write this article eight times and then they picked pieces that like sounded nice together, which is still impressive, just eight times. Um, also humans are easy to fool, which uh, there's this example of clever hunts if people wanna take a bit uh, deeper into that. But actually the capabilities of GPT-3 are extremely, uh, like they are strong. So. What we're seeing is with these large language models, that's how we call them. If, they, if they're big, we just call them like large. And because they're trained on language, we call them language models. Um, the, they can do astounding things. So you can even let them predict something that wasn't even in the training data set and so on. So they're, they're very versatile. Um, we've also arrived at the stage where you can sort of generate music from AI. Let's see, I don't think audio will go through, so. Oh yeah, I should say. So what, you're, so what you're seeing is the prompt, which is kind beaver guards live tree, Stanley Epic. So these, this is like a prompt, this is a text. And then the, this method basically generates a music from that with some pieces in between. The next one is astronaut riding a horse. And the next one is Women the crew cooking left in the One more. Vladimir Lenin smoking weed with Bob Marley. Alright, I think that's enough. Um, but yeah, so. Yeah, is this creative? I don't, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. What's, um, what's also interesting is that actually there's, there's a famous person called Other Lovelace, which wrote, uh, I should have written down the date. It must have been like 18, let's say 60 or something, the following. And she was one of the pioneers of computer science. So she also has a picture somewhere in one of these rooms. Um, she wrote, the analytical engine, uh, that's how she called it, might act upon other things besides number, where objects found whose mutual fundamental relations could be expressed by those of the abstract science of operations, and which should be also sus susceptible of adaptations to the action of the operating rotation mechanism of the engine. Supposing, for instance, that the fundamental relations of pitch sounds and the science of harmony and of musical composition were susceptible of such expression and adaptations, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. So she was definitely ahead of her time. Um, yeah, and she was uh, in the time of Babbage and Turing and uh, you should uh, look her up. Um, right, another example is actually robotics. So I said previously, 
almost no robotics are running AI. It's because robotics is a really, really, really difficult problem. And so now with deep learning actually working decently, people are starting to use them in robotics, but before they get you, well, that's in research. So until they arrive in industry, it's gonna take quite some time. And here's some examples which don't look like much, but actually is, is fairly impressive because getting robots to walk on all kinds of surfaces is extremely tricky. What comes really easy for us to adjust to different friction coefficients of the surface to adjust to different uh, uh, planes and so on is really easy, but for a robot with different joints and different forces is extremely difficult. In this, in, in this case, it's a paper from university, so not all of the research is, is done at uh, companies. Plenty of new research directions and new topics come from universities. Actually, even the, the model which I showed you, which does the AI like pictures thing, main idea actually also came from, from an academic lab. Um, and yeah, so deep learning is really making strides here. And uh, one thing I would recommend, and again, you'll, you'll get these slides, is to actually sign up to some newsletters. This is by no means mandatory. Um, but it's one email per week, um, which tells you a bit about what's currently going on in this community, what, what FAD is happening, or whether, for example, the US has blocked uh, exports of GPUs to China because they're worried about the strategic edge they have. Um, so a bit of global perspective, as well as individual papers that are sor sort of making buzz will be discussed in these. So this is a really good way to uh, stay up to date. All right, um, this actually already concludes this uh, introductory lecture. So we talked about the organization, lectures, tutorials, practicals, assignments, exam. Um, starting from vision, we talked about how deep learning has made progress, about Rosenblatt, about the, the new way of training neural networks, um, how scale is becoming important, but might not be the solution. And we talked about some really cool examples which actually come from scale. Um, yeah, this is that. All right. So unless people have questions on that content, we can actually play around a bit with uh, some uh, image generation. Do people have questions on the content here? Yes? Well, that's a really good question. Um, in the future, obviously, we don't know. At the moment, deep learning is very much based on training data sets, right? So if it doesn't really know that if you help hold an object here that it will fall down, it will just predict that because it has seen a lot of instances like that. But maybe the object is actually, you will say it's actually suspended to the, to the wall and then it won't fall down and it won't know that. So you cannot really model physics into these models yet. So they're all based on correlations. Um, sometimes the correlations get found correctly. For example, in the DALI model, you can say Winnie the Pooh in a lecture hall, even though Winnie the Pooh will be, will have, it will have seen only Winnie the Pooh in some like nature or like near a honey pot or whatever, right? It will learn to disentangle these, but just by chance. <laughs> like sometimes it won't. Like if you type in an ice bear in a lecture hall, it might make the floor icy as well, even though that doesn't make sense or that wasn't inside there. So AI would be very difficult for critical applications, I would say. So anything where, where you cannot, where it's really critical that it works, I wouldn't see AI in the future, unless it's a very controlled environment. And like driving cars is a fairly controlled environment. But still, you have all kinds of exceptions. And that's why we don't have self-driving cars on the streets yet. Like sometimes you have a giant truck which has an image of a house, for example, on the street. And like the AI then, or the model then interprets that as a house instead of a truck. And there's all kinds of weird exceptions. Is the real guy saying that you want to go, you want to use uh, self-driving cars? No, no, we will. I think self-driving is one of the domains where it's fairly controlled, but still within that fairly controlled scenario, you will have all kinds of tricky things. So you need to collect a lot of data. And that's what uh, the companies are doing. Uh, I'm saying AI will be 
or we, 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 will, we need to be very careful about where we apply AI, for example, for critical decisions like bail or medical decisions and these sort of things, because we cannot really explain the decisions that this model is doing and the model is only learning from correlation. So if you train and it needs training data. So if your training data was biased, it's hard to debias the, uh, uh, the outcoming algorithm. Sorry? Yeah, medical, medical domain is, is difficult. There's some approaches where you can, for example, say, have multiple hospitals and no hospital shares the data, but still you can train one model on all of the data. That's called federated learning. So there's some solutions to, to this limited data scenario as well. All right. I mean, also feel free to ask me questions afterwards or uh, in between lectures and so on. Um, right, then I'll quickly... Suggestions? Okay. How do you write it? Why, why do you guys know this so well? <laughs> um, and then what do you want? Let's say a crayon painting. These are like while it's loading and showing some examples. <laughs> yeah, very wholesome. Um, What access? Uh, and like how to do this, like three D render, or that some there's something like a DSLR picture of, for example, um, is another one which like this is all related to the training data because the training data had, for example is from the internet and there were some people that post their 3D rendering creations and then this is basically in the captions so that the model has sort of learned how to associate this with that. I don't know what would happen if we type in 40, but. <laughs> um, so yeah, so there is video generation as well, um, but it's not publicly available yet. It's, it's still uh, closed, yeah. Yeah, so there's also a similar thing for um, videos, which basically makes videos, but videos are a lot trickier. Um, so they don't look quite as good yet, but it's gonna like, by next year's course, videos will be looking pretty well. Um, so any, any other non Vinnie the Pooh suggestion? Sure. Awesome. Ninety D is good. <laughs> Artificial intelligence. Um, what else? Doing this collaboratively. So one thing came from here. How do we continue? What's that? Robots. <laughs> it's still taking over the world. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> We might just see a giant Excel sheet at this point. Um, yeah, come on. So this stuff is, is is fun to play around, but pretty random and uh, yeah, that's you you can waste a lot of time. So here's some examples from people that have shared this. For example, an armchair in the shape of an avocado, or uh, a photo of a white fur monster standing in a purple room. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, here we have this neon thing, futuristic neon lit cyborg face. I mean, yeah, you can you can really use some creativity here. 
abstract painting. Yeah, and uh, so you can also take a look at this website, which they they did admit to like they have a deal now. And so we were always like guessing, oh, they must have trained with like images from this website. And now we actually know that they did and they have a deal with that. And so, for example, you can, yeah, okay, this one just says cyborg woman, but you can see like, okay, that's that's sort of where, where that training data comes from. And that's why some of these prompts, for example, um, an oil pastel drawing or the centered explosion is like very descriptive and very similar to how, how the training data looks. And if you just type in something pretty random, it will sort of try to understand it, but we'll have a hard time basically. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, but they used it before as well. Yeah. And uh, the second is, so when you are actually, so when someone is uh, capturing an image, they would very hardly put uh, negative words in it. Mm -hmm. So for example, if I see a photo of AI yeah. without robots, mm -hmm. they wouldn't say without robots because it's, it's only capturing the positive ones. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yes, yes. That's, that is very good. So it should be more like a spreadsheet that is taking over the world. I don't know. <laughs> um, by the way, there's also GPT-3 here. So for example, this, this is the model that was used to, to generate the article. So you could write something like um, explain why some Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, I haven't used this in a while, um, but there is a... Yeah, this one works, but there was another one where you can actually play around. There's also this one, actually. So yeah, there's a bunch of things nowadays. You can just play around. It's not very, by the way, if you use this, well, you, you can't yet use this for your essays, but. Yeah. yeah, so this, like, it's not, it's not bad, right? And this one is actually using also GPT-3 in the background. Um, and again, it's easy to fool ourselves. Like maybe there was something very related in the training data sets and so on, right? But um Anyways, yeah, yeah. All right, I think that's that's enough playing around, and uh, yeah, you can you can definitely play play around some more in your in your free time. In the meantime, I think I hope I've uh, convinced you a bit that deep learning is like is is crazy at the moment. There's some you can also think about what are some applications where might deep learning arise. And there's a bunch, and someone has might might have already done it, but maybe this this course will also give you some ideas for startups as well. Let me know. All right, thanks, and uh, stick around. You you can have a break. Um, the course the tutorial starts at five p.m. now, so. Mm -hmm. I was wondering about these large models yeah. that you were telling me. Are they continuously being trained or are they being trained once and then They are trained once for the most part. Sometimes they are updated. Why wouldn't they always update? Why wouldn't they always update? Well, it's pretty expensive. And that's why. Yeah. 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 And like, it's not. It's not, I mean, you cannot trust these models to know anything about COVID anyways. Yeah. Or like, yeah. like for example, I mean, it's, it's pretty, if you type in like, yeah, it's just too, too expensive pretty much. Yeah. Uh, 
but so maybe in the future, the maybe in the future that yeah. will happen. Also, I don't know, maybe Google does it. Um, so, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah, so this one yeah. still thinks it's still a Trump, for example. And I, so you can tell when the model was trained, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, will you upload the slides? Yes. Okay, and uh, for the next one, can you upload them to the forward or something like that? Yeah, yeah, I've got that. Yes, I will do that. Yeah, thanks. Will the tutorial be just the starting PyTorch? The tutorial will be introduction to PyTorch, neural networks in PyTorch, and Lisa getting access to the cluster as well. Um, but I think this one will be also done on Friday. So, so yeah. Fine. Will you skip it on PyTorch? I believe so. Yeah. I'll do that. Yeah, thank you. All right. Hey. Mm -hmm. self-driving car because you can simulate like a car and like rl basically needs a simulation to be running and so everything that you can simulate there it might be a good way um, and some of the algorithms might also be useful for like molecule discovery and stuff like that um, but i'm not super familiar with yeah. sure. hey. Question about the deadline. Uh, mm -hmm. You said there were no extensions possible. Mm -hmm. um, I will be presenting a paper to your ex conference in your release. Mm -hmm. And okay. it, it collides exactly with the second deadline. Mm -hmm. um, does it mean there are no, no extensions possible? Because even one day would mean that I could work after you after get back at that time. I mean, because but one day. You just need to start one day early. <laughs> That's true. Um, because we will be there for one week. So uh, 26 to second, and I think the deadline is in the second. So to go over it again and to yeah, that, that's true. I could start. Yeah, the yeah, I would recommend that. And so you have a paper, so you know PyTorch, I guess. Or I so the second assignment will be a lot of coding. So probably as soon as we have, I mean, maybe you. Yeah, as soon as the second assignment is out, you'll be able to more or less finish it properly. Mm. Because the first one is if you do that, yeah, uh, immediately do this as well. I think it will be because then I would have enough time, yes. Yeah, you, you will have enough time, so usually it's at least like two weeks or something, and if you and yeah, especially if you're comfortable with coding and PyTorch, this one will be like fairly easy. Like, it will be very low on theoretical questions. That's why. It's fine. So, all right. Good luck. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say the extra how to research it. Uh -huh. Really like okay. it. Okay. I don't know how to research it. Yeah. Like, oh, this is so valuable. <laughs> I'm seeing it in my insights. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. So you're already writing the master thesis? Or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is the really like the still very harsh yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, it's also made that we're going to find it's called make that we're going to terrible. Yeah, so that's also not the bad. They can actually make that. Yeah. Oh, and so we just want to get it. They only have this website. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty safe. Yeah. 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 It's going to be 10 years. We're going to have to just entirely generate it. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it will take so long. Probably in half a year, we have, we have open source of this. And by that time, next week, we'll have to 
Good, good question. Um, Do maybe, you know? <laughs> I don't know, but there's maybe the maybe that. Hey, how did it work? Yeah, good, good. Trying to find light. <laughs> <laughs> well, usually it's on here. Uh, you mean like by pressing this, right? Here. Yeah, and in the old one, it basically had a different control. That's strange. Um, yeah, I tried that. <laughs> But usually also... 